Uh huh. Yeah, turn me up a little bit in the headphones. <laughs> Let's. I came up, it's time I switched the game up Call my own lane, now it's time I speed it up When you in your cut, you hear me, man I hope you speak this much Moving to the music I made When I'm stationed in the city To the girls that threw me plenty But I'm right, they was with me To every show I What makes Bayview different is the people give you something to like about your community. Like, man, it's a legendary neighborhood, neighborhood community, you feel me? Hunters Point is one of the cornerstones of the community. In Hunters Point, we're not only trying to uh, build good houses, but we're also trying to build a better image. When you love something and you care about something, then it makes you want to be a part of it and you care about what's going on in that area. Bayview is the struggle, it is the fight, and it's the last stronghold in San Francisco for black people. Bayview Huntsport community is on the southeast section of San Francisco. It's a beautiful neighborhood. It has some of the best views of anywhere in the city. Bayview Hunters Point has been largely off the radar of everybody who doesn't live there. It's an underutilized, underpopulated, often ignored neighborhood. In the southeast corner of San Francisco, where most of the city's factories, warehouses, and junkyards are, a stubby finger of land pokes out into the bay. At the end of it, a hill rises like an abscess from the stink and the noise. And on the hill live some of the most disadvantaged citizens of this or any other American city. The place is called Hunter's Point. It's hard to think that in a city as sophisticated as San Francisco, with its record, that you had this little village, I'll call it, out on a peak, on a point isolated, that was treated differently from the rest of the city. I was quite young, and I had come from college and the civil rights movement and marched around protesting the war in Vietnam. and protested for women's rights and against racism and against homophobia and we were very naive. We thought all that stuff would be over in about five years. But when I came to Bayview, it was my first experience of really seeing what it was like to live in a poor community. When the uh, Navy shipper came in and a lot of people from the South came to work in the Navy ship, that brought the more African-American influence to this community. Bayview Hunters Point has such a rich history what it meant for black people leaving the South to come to California for opportunity. And it represented, you know, a beacon for a new way forward that my grandparents participated in. My grandfather worked the shipyard uh, way back in the day, and he was in the Navy. So they came out here, they got homes. This is where he built the skills to go on to have a trade. Mayor John F. Shelley has asked the city supervisors for $350,000 to rehabilitate the wartime housing at Hunter's Point. Most of the housing in the early days was housing left over from the government. They'd been built so that uh, those people working at the Hunter's Point shipyard would have a place to live near work. But many years after the war that was in the 40s was over, people were still living in those houses. The buildings are a hangover from the Second World War, barracks built by the Navy to house shipyard workers. Instead of tearing them down 20 years ago, the Navy gave the structures to the city. Most are rat infested, structurally unsound, and generally unfit for people to live in. And what happened to your son? My son caught infotigo from a, a uh, lice that was on the, uh, the rat. Where the, how does that affect him on his? He has a, a bad skin rash, which bumps. It caused the bumps, and if he gets one bite, he scratches and it spreads all over his body. The families that lived in Bayview had come from somewhere in the South, where, of course, they had very little right to complain to people in authority, especially if they were white. And they had to learn that here it was different and that they could do it, but that took some time. Bayview Hunters Point epitomizes problems of racism, classism, and, and discrimination that characterized this great country since its founding. San Francisco has always been a racist place. You know, their history 
is racist. But they didn't worry about it too much until World War II when all those black people came out here. The highest they had back in those days was four or 5,000 people. There was no political pressure coming from four or 5,000 people. San Francisco? Yeah. Oh, man, I'm going to tell you about San Francisco. <laughs> the white man, he's not, he's not taking advantage of you out in public like they're doing down in Birmingham, but he's killing you with that pencil and paper, brother. Inevitably, there is an atmosphere of fear and tension on the hill. Some spectacular acts of violence have occurred here, giving the neighborhood a more sinister reputation than it deserves. The youth uh, feel that the police are occupying this community and that they are being oppressed by the police and that uh, the police, uh, in, while enforcing the law, uh, oftentimes break the law. Most of the officers don't understand the black community. Most of the officers don't understand black people living here. And uh, there is a, a degree of fear on uh, both parts. There were two fellows in the car, and they jumped out, one from each side. And they started running, and I, by this time, stopped my car. And I jumped out, and I yelled to them to stop. Stop, I want to talk to you. Matthew Peanut Johnson, uh, he was a very uh, well-liked and beloved member of the community. But you don't expect to lose your life for stealing a car, a, a, an old car. He ran, he was un, uh, unarmed, and he was shot in the back. I pulled out the gun and I said, now listen fellas, stop or I'm gonna shoot. And the boy was running down the hill and I put the gun in the air and I shot three times in the air and then the boy was out Oh, 225, 250 feet, I guess, way out, and I shot one shot in his direction, and he was on top of a hill, and he didn't come back or up from the other side of the hill, and I figured, well, I guess he's hiding down there, and I quickly ran down there and expected to find the boy kind of scared down there, and I ran down there, and I saw the boy lying flat in his face and blood out of his mouth, and there wasn't very much he could do. It was all, I don't feel so good. That was basically the fuse, if you will. The shooting was the fuse that lit a powder keg that led to the uprising in the community. Governor Pat Brown brought out 500 National Guards and had another 1,500 uh, on the way. We cannot have uh, revolution in this country and I can assure the people of my state that I will do everything within my power to see that law and order uh, is uh, observed and that uh, the rights of person and property are carefully protected. And I'll tell you this, we're going to meet force with force. When they come down with National Guards, and trucks, and police, and lined both sides of the streets with rifles and pointing them up at the windows. And people had their families and kids looking out the window. Then they was uh, saying, "Get in!" and and they had the guns and things, and rifles and things out pointed, but the people in the windows, you know. And I don't, I don't think that was necessary. It wasn't just the shooting alone that sparked the uprising in Bayview Hunters Point. It was the living conditions being so harsh and lack of access. We don't want to accept all this off the wall propaganda which you all have been giving us for the past nine and 10 years. We want some concrete. We don't want it next week, we want it now. The issues around surrounding black Americans back then had to do with the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which finally codified you know, our wholeness to the degree that we had access to transportation, we had laws that barred people from stopping us from drinking at fountains and eating in restaurants. That was a liberating time. From there, people based upon the law that now say I have civil rights began to realize they didn't have to take all of the stuff that was being thrown their way. In Hunter's Point, as in most black communities, the burden of public responsibility has been shouldered largely by black women. The current leader of the local matriarchy is Mrs. Eloise Westbrook. Miss Westbrook, to me, was the epitome of leadership in Bayview Harness Point. She is chairman of the Joint Housing Committee. 
a remarkable grassroots organization that has demanded and gotten real decision-making power over urban renewal on the hill. Eloise Westbrook was, had a big presence. I want you to know that I, I am a black woman. She was tall. She had a big voice. I'm a mother, and I have 15 grandchildren. And she did not hesitate to say what was on her mind. I only have but one life to give, children. When I die, I'm dead. And you better believe it. But I'm dying for the rights of people. She was herself at all times, and people knew that what they heard from her, they could believe. Even though we have built these homes, and even though they are very beautiful, and we're trying to get people into them, one of the long-range plans is the Indian Basin era, where that we can have the industrial, that the people who live in this era might have jobs that they might obtain and live here forever and ever and ever. And she uh, found uh, other women who were willing to stand up for their children and their grandchildren in that community. There's this group that was called the Big Five. Eloise Westbrook, Osceola Washington. Oh, I'm sorry to say no. These young men have grew up in this situation. Uh, Polish brutality, uh, poor schools, poor education, kickouts mostly. They call them dropouts, but they're kick out in Hunters Point. Bertha Friedman. But I think it's a great honor for these people that they can say, I have it myself. And I don't have to wait for a handout. Ruth Williams. And I'm here to say I'm from the ghetto community. All right, now I'm from the ghetto community and at the sound of my voice, when I rise up, just about the masses of Hunters Point rises up too. And uh, Rosalie Williams, those were considered the big five. They decided that, uh, that the blight and the need for new housing was so compelling that these five women uh, who were considered powerhouses at the time had various types of gifts and control in their respective areas of influence. I feel very upset because for, for so long we have been appealing to uh, uh, other funding agencies for money and it always seems as though there's something wrong with this particular organization or agency and I think it's just because we're poor people trying and the funding agencies like Ford and, and, and the United Crusade and all, they never give us anything. I actually think that they surprised themselves at what they could do by just articulating the problems and talk about the broken promises. They went to Washington, D.C. and met with the Senator Philip Burton, and they lobbied and advocated for the, him to get some money into San Francisco, this Bayview community, so that we can tear down those old public housing and get some new structures built. And they would not leave. Washington, D.C. until they brought back tens of millions of dollars to start what we see in Hunters Point today. It was their dream. There was a lot of pushback on uh, whether they were going to release those funds back to Bayview Hunters Point. And I recall vividly Miss Westbrook saying that this belongs to the community. And if you're not careful, you, you may lose it. I don't know how to describe these women. <laughs> because you wonder uh, where they got their ideas about what was possible. I said I wasn't gonna cry, but I've been crying ever since I stood, up, stood on this here stage. Because I know and you know that this is what we have dreamed for, for many years. What the city is particularly concerned about is that all their efforts to rehabilitate the housing in the Hunters Point area will be for naught unless they can have jobs, and the logical place for jobs is here at the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. Roland Post for Eyewitness News, San Francisco. We have to let the people know what closure of Hunters Point Naval Shipyard is doing. It's not just finding other people jobs. These men here, uh, uh, like this gentleman here, is a, is a disabled vet. He's doing a job well, well done here on the yard, and uh, they got to look out for them too. And I think that uh, they ought to be closing down some of those uh, overseas spaces before they close down shipyards here at home, which can do the job much more efficiently. I think it's going to hurt everybody, just like he says. You know, it's something nobody wants to hear anywhere in the world, as far as that goes. It's going to be kind of hard, but the people, you know. Standing here before you, I cannot tell you that in my pocket I have 320 jobs for Monday morning. But I am willing 
together with others and together with yourselves to put pressure on those agencies where we feel the, the money is and where jobs perhaps can come. What happened is people left the baby because of the high murder rates and the high crime rate, but the high crime rate and the high murder rate was all come from the issue of unemployment and no jobs here. There haven't been any jobs here since they closed the shipyard. It wasn't good because we couldn't get employment. Uh, nobody wanted to hire people from this particular neighborhood, you know, for some reason because most people uh, they figured it was bad in this particular neighborhood. Because everybody got to eat and support their family, you know. And when you have kids and family, you know, you can't just go home every day and tell your girlfriend or your wife, like, oh, I don't have no milk or, or anything like that. A lot of unemployment and people just feeling discouraged that they couldn't get work. Yeah, you, you know, you're a man, so you go do anything necessary to provide and put that food on the table, even in, necessarily if it's not honest. Drugs were a big problem. Uh, not just people smoking weed, but a lot of people using heroin. And it was kind of like an epidemic. There has been no consistent effort in the past to try and get persons who are on methadone to lose the addiction that they have or give up the addiction they have to methadone itself. So you will attempt to get those people who are addicted to drugs off of all kinds of drugs, including methadone? That's correct, exactly. In the late 80s, the drug was, was crack. And you know, you thought heroin destroyed families. Wait till you see what happened with crack. If you had to live here and you couldn't get a job and you could make the sun come up every day for $10, you'd use it too. There was a lot of money in the drug trade. It really was, and it, and it helped a lot of families. Folks were buying things they needed and buying things they wanted too. Um, and experiencing the world in a different way because of the drug trade. But as far as the incarceration and the death that came with it, I don't think if we look back, that's something we would want to trade. The drug epidemic and the crack epidemic of the 80s wiped all the OGs out. It had a devastating effect on families, on generations to come. What we know about Bayview now is that as a neighborhood trying to rebuild and remake itself. I don't see that developers who have bought up a lot of the land in San Francisco really following through on promises to offer jobs to community residents. I see new cafes being put up, I see new restaurants being put up, and um, the community is not involved as far as an employment, and they wanna, they wanna have us at the, the ground stages of the, of the development, but when it comes to staffing the whole thing, we're left out. The same issues that we was having then of young black folks not having the opportunity to get jobs and to work and to uh, better themselves legally, they still left out. You know, it's like uh, everything is building up around them, but they're not involved. And they don't have an idea how to get involved because nobody want to go out there and reach out to them. You know what I mean? In San Francisco, as far as history or whatever, Black people or low-income people have them majority of the work. I mean, it's time for you the guys to stop living off our back and give something back. What is misrepresented about Baby is that everybody here is a criminal or involved in crime. Some of us are just hardworking teachers, parents and productive citizens. I am a native to Bayview. I grew up in Bayview. I was born and raised in Bayview Hunters Point or HP. It was tough at times. I mean, what neighborhood doesn't have some type of toughness, but it made me who I am today. My most difficult memories of growing up in Bayview was losing a lot of like the young man that I used to go to school with. That was a dramatic blow for all of us being so young and experienced, losing our friends, you know, by the hands of, of, of violence. Because up here in Hunters Point, it was like, uh, you had to either be a wolf, and if you was a sheep, you couldn't be here. So practically everybody here was wolves and fighters. And, Cause I lost my big brother when I was two years old to um, to that gang stuff. That tore down my mom. Like that's what really made my mom start going like losing it. And I don't want to see my mom like that no more ever. Like ever, I don't want to see her smoke crack and none of that no more. So that's why I'm like, I can't get killed out here. I gotta I gotta succeed in my life. So I just 
changed my life. Like, Mom, you ain't got to worry about me. I'm going to handle this for sure. So you ain't got to worry about me, Mom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for me and you, for my whole family. My brother, I'm here today, my brother, to speak to you a truth. In ignorance, do you do what you do? Will not another brother know just how you must feel? This is wrong, but it's so very, very real. Don't take it upon yourself to enter this jungle alone. Without a leader, you can't last very long. I think the message has been said by generation after generation that people are beginning to get it, that these are people who don't want to have these things happen to them. To know that, you know, all the fighting and all the suffering and all the struggle for the benefit of the people, that we're still not where we should be or where we could be. But there's people that are living to this day that have streets named after them you know, that we know nothing about. We're on these streets and don't even know the history. The only way that a community is going to heal is through the expression of the history. As a person who didn't really know my own grandparents, I definitely took a liking to when I started to learn those stories as a younger person. And they really inspired me and motivated me to do a lot of the community work that I did. The people who live in Hunters Point, who have lived there for numerous of years, at one time had lost all hope, all faith, but we do feel like hope is began to come back up again. The role of hope is just to keep waking up every day, you know, struggling, surviving, doing whatever it is that people do in their day-to-day -day lives and just being hopeful that things will change. It, it has been a challenge, but I've been succeeding because like my family, they seeing me like I started from the bottom. Now I'm rising myself up. They saying like, oh, he can do it. I know I can do it, so. We just need uh, a little caring and a little help. You know what I mean? And if we get that help, I know it's gonna be good. We really bring that positivity that the community is really thriving for. And I think with the efforts that we've done within the past, uh, I wanna say, two years, uh, working along with the San Francisco Art Commission, we've brought a lot of great events and just brought out a lot of great people. Well, you know, we have a program uh, called Old School Cafe, where I'm the chef instructor at, and we, uh, we, we take in at-risk youth and, and teach them how to run a restaurant. We also give them life skills and uh, a, lot of, a lot of things to help them keep focused and, and stay off the streets. I've definitely seen a lot of change, and I feel like if there was one thing that I could change for the better, it would be the people that are moving in if they got involved in their community. I mean, this is a beautiful place, and as positive as I am about it, um, it's not going to be better for everyone unless we can all share those resources, unless we can all enjoy this neighborhood. I like that we have a, a mixed community with uh, Latinos, white, uh, Japanese, uh, all races. I, I love it because when I was raised up here, there was only black. You know what I mean? And I think uh, it takes everybody to make a difference, not only blacks and Chinese, it takes everybody. You know what I mean? And so I love it. You know, I love to see different people walking down the streets that don't look like me. As they said, come as one, because we all came from the same area, same background. So if we change that, we can be untouchable, unstoppable. So we got power, but we got to put it together and use it. But I believe with years to come, it'll be a better Bayview. On the sign, it'll say, Better Bayview Hunters Point. The festival here in Gilman Park in Hunters Point brought together the old and the young, the uh, militant and the passive for a relaxed afternoon of socializing and dancing under a warm, pleasant San Francisco sun. The relaxed atmosphere here was symbolic of the theme of this get-together, a celebration of a summer of racial peace in San Francisco. What were the... Babe, you got everything to offer in the world. No, you ain't gotta leave, baby. That's 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 my 
my outlook or my definition of baby. You, you want to party? You want to um, do something positive? You want to do something negative? Everything is here. <laughs> Everything. Bayview 100 Point is evolving. Bayview is the flavor of San Francisco. Bayview Hunters Point is my home. Bayview is my home. Yeah, Bayview is my hood. I'm gonna be a Negro president in this country. I'm never be a Negro president in this country. Why do you say that? You can't get jobs, how are we gonna be a president? Got me. But I want you to think about this. There will be a Negro president of this country. But it will not be the country that we, that we are seeing it now. But if you say to yourself, there never will be a Negro president in this country, then what you're doing is agreeing with white people who say you are inferior. It's not important, really, you know, whether or not there's a Negro president. I mean, in that way. What's important is that you should realize that you can become, you can become the president. There's nothing anybody, anybody can do that you can't do. Thank you.